All right, so you're thinking about buying your own little piece of heaven, your own little piece of Texas, and you're wondering, mm, do I really know all the different pros and cons and all the little details that I need to know? Well, if you're interested in that, then you're in the right place, and we're gonna be getting after it right now. Hey everybody, I'm Kerry Fletcher, a land and ranch realtor right here in the great state of Texas. And if you're curious about anything and everything about this lifestyle, what does it cost? Uh, where are the best places to go? What is it like to live, eat, sleep, drink, land and ranch living? Well, this is the channel for you. Hit that subscribe button, ring that little bell, that way you're notified with new videos every time we post them. And when you're ready to make that purchase decision when you're ready to jump in with both feet give us a call send us a text message send us an email heck you can even send us a note via Pony Express any which way we've got your back now today you're in luck today we have this wonderful opportunity to talk to uh, a married couple who have uh, a husband and wife who've been living this land and ranch lifestyle for 30 years, all over the state of Texas. They've had big acreage, small acreage, built their own house a couple of times, and they have some wonderful stories to tell about the good, about the bad, about the pros, about the cons. So stick around. It's Randy and Michelle Fletcher, Nani and Poppy, and they happen to be my mom and dad. Sometimes, as they say, you choose the lifestyle. Other times the lifestyle chooses you. I was born and raised in this and uh, have been around it my whole life. So I'm looking forward to interviewing these guys and drawing out some of those great stories that you need to know. Now stick around. Some of the funniest and the best are at the end. We stuck with horses. Now subsequently we moved again and we moved to uh, Rockdale where we live now. And subsequently, we got back into horses. And, well, and first we gave up horses because when our, we moved. our kids had found wheels and girls. Well, we did still have horses. We had horses. We didn't sell we the did. horses until, until we, we moved. moved. To Rockdale, but right. So we had to sell all our horses because we had no place to keep them. And we didn't do anything with horses for a few years. And then we had some friends that had bought horses for their kids and ask us to kind of take care of the horses. So we started taking care of them and riding them. They were older horses and we took them a lot of different places riding. We bought a trailer and rebought a trailer and a, and a truck and we would go horseback riding. Now this is different than what we had been doing. We had been doing play days and rodeo and this just was pleasure riding. We would go to big trail rides we went to some in Lano and Mason and all over just trail riding. And we got, kind of got started in that because of, we had a friend in Gulfway that uh, his name was Gene Earl Aldridge. And Gene Earl, uh, this big trail ride in Lano, he rented horses to all these people out of the city that didn't own one but wanted to come on a trail ride. And this trail ride was huge. There was between 300 and 500 people there every time he had a ride riding. So he rented about 12 or 15 horses out to different people. So I would go and help him saddle the horses in the morning and, and then Michelle wanted to go so we got back into, got into trail riding with the horses. And we, that was, I'll leave. 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, well, no it's more than 30 years ago. And we have, uh, we have ever since then, we have just been trail riding and we need to get back to why we bought this place. When we were, we were, had this, we wanted to find about 10 acres because mm -hmm. that was kind of a really good size for us when we were in Brownwood. And we wanted to find about 10 acres and we were hunting, about two years we were looking. And our son had subsequently moved to Rockdale. He graduated from high school, graduated in college, moved back to Rockdale and he had a, a job at a, uh, an alcohol plant and he had gone to a farewell party out at their hunting lodge. And when he came back, this place, he, had, he saw this for sale sign on this place. 
Well, that was on a Friday. Saturday morning, we made an appointment to go see the place. And that's when this young lady, you well, tell her. Yeah, you tell we were story. looking for, yeah. The minute we stepped, we went with our, your brothers, everybody was there. And we drove out onto the place. And the minute we got onto the place, I said, this is my place. And I said, I know we can't afford it because it was a lot more acres than we had planned. And a lot more expensive. I said, I, and a lot more expensive, yes. And I said, I, I know we can't afford it. And I don't know how you're going to pay for it. But this is my place. And it was. It's been my place ever since. It's my... I would say it's my dream, but I never dreamed of owning of owning such a place. It, it was beyond my dreams. But once I got there, it is. I knew that it was it was my place. And we weren't going to build. We weren't. Gonna, we had a place paid for in town, a house paid for. We weren't going to build. And then one day, we were finding ourselves out there all the time. And uh, Randy says, well, okay, if we can sell him thinking, no way, because the housing market had started to go down, down, down. He said, if we can sell it, then we'll build out there. So we put the house in town up for sale. And what, well, within three, a week? Three two, weeks. Three weeks later, we had a contract on it. It was a contract. It, was, it went real fast and for a whole lot more money than I than ever dreamed ever of. Dreamed. And we thought, well, no way is it going to go through. We never read. We didn't have plans for our house. We didn't know what kind of house we were going to build. We didn't know anything because we didn't think it was going to go through. Well, it was one of those funky financing things. They mm -hmm. were financing 125% of the loan and just didn't think it would ever close. And uh, then one Friday, they called me and said, we're closing Monday. And... I had no place to go. I didn't have anything uh, to do. So we had to get some storage buildings and we had to move out. And luckily a friend of ours had a garage apartment kind of thing. And we lived in it for three weeks. And then we got a trailer and we got our house plans together. And we lived in this trailer um, for oh, four or five months till we got the house built. The first thing we built was a 12 by 12 uh, kind of a storage building, but we had a washer and dryer was in there, a refrigerator was in there, the freezer, a shower, uh, a commode, a sink, and a little closet, and that's kind of where we had everything. That was great. And we slept in the trailer. We cooked outside because it was a real small trailer, and we cooked outside, and we took showers and everything in this little uh, house that I built. And then we started the house, and again, uh, Michelle and I built most of it. Mm -hmm. We uh, we had a one of the things about building a house that I had learned over the years is the most important thing about building a house outside the design is the foundation. There's bad soil around where we live and we spent a whole lot more money on the foundation than most people do because I wanted it to work. We had some engineers come in and we ended up taking all the soil out and bringing in a new soil uh, and built a really good foundation. The house is not big. The inside of the house is uh, about 1,800 square feet, but we've got another 1,800 square feet of porches. We'd always wanted a big porch and we've got a 60 by 15 porch on the back and a 60 by 10 foot porch on the front where we and we use them all the time. We're, you can actually use the porch. We'd had so many houses. You had a porch, but you couldn't even sit on them because they were so small. So we actually use these. We've had parties out there uh, on the back porch, barbecues for the, the front, neighbors. And the front porch is coffee for in the mornings. Yeah. The back porch is wine and parties in the evening. And evening. But we didn't have we didn't have plans when we moved out there. We had no idea. We thought log cabin. Barn Dominium, we went through, we, for months, we had no clue. And then we went on that trail ride to Johnson City. And there's where we saw one of the traditional Austin ranch style house uh, with the cedar post on the front porch. And 
and the there metal roof. Lot. The yeah. metal roof. Through. Theirs were a lot fancier than what we well, yeah, built. Yeah, what we did. But still, it was uh, when we saw that was it, that's it. That's the house we want. Is the the Texas Ranch, White Austin Stone metal building, cedar post on the porch, and it's uh, now that it's there, it's looked like it's been there forever. I mean, yeah. it, it fits in with the landscape. So why was what was so unique about this particular place that that? you just knew that it was your place it was better than what you dreamed what drew you to it i i don't know it was just so um well number one what we thought it was outrageous the price but then after after we analyzed it had been a it had been a working farm for generations i traced it all the way back to the spanish land grant when milam county uh still had the spanish uh, land grants and um, it was, um, it had only had about four, maybe five owners in all those years. And it had been a working farm. It was all fenced. It had two big barns, uh, all kinds of sheds. It was, um, and at one time there was a house. We know there was a house there at one time. Um, it had four tanks. In Texas, a tank is a, what, a pond is other places, uh, but it had four really nice tanks and had cross fencing on it. It um, no mosquitoes. Randy's made sure to keep it mosquito free. Well, one of the things we had we've been looking for two years, and most everything we saw, and she was talking about analyzing the cost, was covered in mosquitoes and had no outbuildings or anything. Mm -hmm. And when you Figure in the cost of removing the mesquites, building the barns and stuff that were there, that, then, then it really wasn't that much more expensive than going buying raw land and doing all that yourself. And it's a whole lot less work. So we bought it. Uh, but it was scary because we were both teachers. No, not much money. It, yeah. was, it was a huge investment and scary investment at that time. And. I quit being a teacher and started working in the construction business and made a lot more money, which allowed us to, to have the place. And, you know, we, we, if you have ever owned land, especially a, a land that size, it's constant work. Never done acres. Never done acres. You are, you always got a project to do. We, we have replaced all the outside fences except one because they had been there since the 60s and they were, they were rusty. We have replaced most of the internal off this place and, and we were saying that the, the cost of removing all the mesquites and you remove the mesquites because they, they suck the water out of the place and you really can't have livestock or much livestock on a place with, when it's loaded with mesquite. It just takes so up so much room and they're so evasive that if you don't deal with them and you don't stay on top of them, they, they'll just take over your place and your place will be just covered with mosquitoes. Now, a lot of people moving from the city, they like to come out and they want it wooded places and, and stuff. Uh, but you know, if you get into, we're in what's called the post oak savannah. And if you got post oaks and that kind of trees, we have a part of our place is covered with big oak trees. Those are okay. It's the mesquites and the cedars that are, uh, I'm gonna trash trees, but they will, if you don't keep uh, on top of them, they will take over your place. So I, I'm, I'm very vigilant about riding down around the place and, and, and looking for them. If I find them, I've got a grubbing hoe and I grub them up and then I put some poison on the roots to make sure they don't come back. Uh, cedars, you can just cut down and they won't grow back. But mesquites, if you just cut them off at the ground, instead of growing up, they grow out. And if you drive your ATV or tractor or something out there, then you end up having flats. So I'm very vigilant about keeping the mesquites off of it. But you know, and I'm here asking myself, why the heck do we do all this? I mean, this is just nothing but work. But one of the main reasons that it's being in the land and here during COVID, when I would hear about people being 
in their New York apartments for weeks on end, never being able to get outside. And I thought every day we could just go outside and we go out, we spend a lot of time outside. Now, as a matter of fact, during the, during the COVID, you guys, y'all sort of became a family hub, right? Yeah. I mean, I know uh, my two kids came there and spent, <laughs> spent a good bit of time and it made us feel safe that they yeah. were outside of the big city and were able to to stay with y'all yeah they got caught there but they were there for spring break and that's when everything started shutting down and they were able to stay there in the country being outside every day being having fresh air being uh being working in the garden you know so tell me a little bit about uh Mr. Backhouse, you know, you said you traced this history, mm -hmm. you know, it was a very valuable. And so for me, when I look at your ranch, ranchette, small farm, whatever you want to call it, ranch. uh, branch, it's, it's, it's a lot like a piece, a living piece of artwork, a living piece of history. And not only do you get to enjoy the beauty of it and the aesthetics of it, but you also get to mold it and shape it for that next generation. But I'd, I'd love to hear some of those stories about, you know, what, what you inherited with this purchase. Well, when we bought the land, Mr. Backhouse, Gus Backhouse had owned it. He and Ann, his wife, had owned it and, and his dad had owned it since back in the 40s and before World War II. And he'd done a lot of work. He's no German guy that when he, he, he built fences and he built all this stuff in the barns, he put little, little plaques, plaques on it, said mm -hmm. when, he, when he built it. And on the, on the facing of the barn door, every year there was a history of how many bales of hay he made and put in the barn and then how many he took out and sold or used. So you had a living history there of what had happened to the place. That was basically his, his books, his accounting. His, his accounting. accounting. And uh, we, he had a, a tool shed. Uh, it was an old house or something that he kept his tools in. And we found when we bought the place and, and started going through all this stuff, we found his World War II locker in there that had all his stuff from World War II. We also found a carpenter's locker that had saws and levels and all kinds of stuff that was probably from back in the 40s or 30s where a carpenter would go build something. He'd have all his tools in this toolbox, which was a big locker kind of thing. And all kinds of tools, chains, uh, just, it was full of and, stuff. And everything marked. He was very, being that he had that German, uh, taking uh, stock of everything and knowing where everything was. Whenever we had to take down fences, every time we, we would get the little metal tag that he had taken and a nail, like the Germans, you, you, you've you probably seen the little tags and he would hammer in. You know, the tags are tin, the little yeah, pieces, little of, pieces tin of tin like this. I treasure them, I collect them. I Whenever we do have to take a fence down, I always collect those little, uh, because he would mark the date, mm -hmm. uh, the day, the date, and the year. Uh, there's always these little treasures of history that Gus left all over the place. I, I take uh, the old bob wire quite often and make a wreath out of it, and I use those tags. I use the insulation, because he had the whole place uh, electrified, uh, and, and I have all the little insulators that I put on the wreath, and then I add uh, deer, deer, deer sheds, spurs, spurs any, it, uh, horseshoes, always horses. horseshoes on there. Some little Spanish moss off of the Yeah, just things of, uh, of the history of that and the history of Texas are put on those uh, bob wire wreaths. Bob wire, bob wire, by the way. I didn't know that it, until I was a teenager that it's not bob wire, it's bob. barbed wire. Bob. Yeah, but bob wire, when you have a bob wire wreath, you know, it's part of part of the history of our of our place. The sheds that were there, the sheds were uh, just, well, they were all built from, we know there was an old house there. And we always finding pieces and bits. Uh, 
the floors of our barns, every once in a while you'll see a piece with some um, wallpaper. wallpaper on it. Uh, you know that came from that old house, we'll find a doorknob. Um, Gus never got rid of anything. He, Very he, frugal. He used everything. And so some of the sheds are built from the old wood. Uh, it, it's, it's just a, a wonderful, you find him little treasures all the time from the past of that place. It's, and she's really big about that. I'm on the other end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. I would just soon tear them down and put a nice mm -hmm. modern barn up, but she won't let me. No. Uh, but Gus was, you're always finding stuff where Gus had, had done something and then he left his mark there that he did this and he was very frugal. So you find in this, uh, we don't find so much new stuff anymore since we've owned it for 14 years. But uh, when we first moved, we found it all the time. Now this place has also got uh, petrified wood on it. Uh, we've got quite a bit of petrified wood we've picked up over the years. We've given it to a lot of people there. It's something as a souvenir. We have people come all the time and ride horses and stuff people that from the city or uh, friends of our kids or, or friends of ours that have kids that they bring them out and we take them horseback riding and they'll end up getting a little piece of petrified wood or something as a souvenir. So, now anybody that owns a horse is an idiot. Yeah. Just, just, just know that right off because horses are, are, are such a pain. They're born looking for a vet. They're, they're just eating machines. They're, they're really such a pain, but, but they're magic. They're magic. There's something magical about them, and there's certainly something magical about our place. Our, our place is when we have people come, we forget, um, especially city kids coming out, you, you forget how magical being outdoors and being in a place like that. And having the horses, the kids, of course, are drawn to those horses. They're, they are magic. Her brother lives in Ohio, and he lives on about 100 acres in Ohio. And, but he loves coming to Texas and loves to come visit us because of the horses and the well, in the weather also, but he loves to visit and he loves to ride horses, and but he doesn't own one himself. So it's it's the cheapest way to, to ride a horse is know somebody that has one because they can be expensive. You know, you have to put shoes on them, you have to vaccinate them, you have to worm them. You have uh, a thing called a Coggins test, which is a test for a disease that you have to get annually before you can haul them anywhere. The horse is nothing to the cost. Right. Somebody will give you a horse, they're not doing you a favor. <laughs> Promise you they're not doing you a favor because it's, there's a lot of maintenance to them, a horse. And if you really don't love them and you don't use them all the time, they're really pain. No such thing we, as a free horse. We use them all the time. We were, we, last weekend we were riding and uh, we took them on a, a, to a place south of Colleen and rode. We just got back from Missouri. We spent a week in, uh, in a place called Black Missouri and rode in the Ozark Mountains. We've been to Oklahoma this year, been to New Mexico twice, been to Colorado. We've been to uh, Utah uh, hauling horses. We haul our horses out there and we ride them. So we use our horses all the time. Now we've had horses, these two particular horses that we ride for a long time, about 12, 13 years. So they're, they're really good for taking in and really haven't had that much uh, problems with them. Some people have a lot of problems. We have a friend that has got this horse and I bet they've spent $10,000 on this horse because they've had pigeon fever, they've gotten bit by a rattlesnake, they've had all this stuff go wrong with this horse and they end up taking the vet and spending thousands of dollars. And we really haven't experienced that much. A lot of it is because we have our own place and the horses are, uh, I, I want to say free range, they're out grazing on the grass all the time and they're not in a stall. They're running and playing and stuff outside and they keep in pretty good shape. We don't have to get them up and reteach them anything. Uh, they're pretty much steady horses. Now look, if you've been enjoying this video so far, do me a favor, hit that little like button. It really helps the channel, helps the video, helps with the algorithms. But also, 
if you have any questions, if there's some story that really talked to you, or if there's something that you want to know more about, just put it in the, the comment section down there and I'll reach back out to you or I'll get Nani and Poppy to reach out to you and uh, also gives us some great ideas for follow-up videos. Now back to Nani and Poppy. You know, we've owned property in different places. We've owned horses, we've owned cows, we've owned goats. And if, if the purpose of this is to, to give some advice, I will, we will give you a little advice. Don't do this unless you're really committed to this kind of lifestyle because it is a lot of work. There's a wonderful things about it. We have this big garden every spring that we raise tomatoes and onions and stuff in. We've got flowers everywhere. Uh, she loves the garden. Uh, we've got horses. I, personally, I, I didn't want to own cows anymore, so I leased part of my place to a guy that's got cows on it. We really didn't talk about ag exemption but in, in Texas, if you're going to own property, you really need to have an ag exemption. And every county is a little bit different on what they authorize or what they allow for exemptions. But you need to have an ag exemption because if you don't, the taxes will eat you up. Uh, we've got 60 acres and we pay about $2,500 a year in taxes. And we had some friends in Dripping Springs that only owed 10 acres and they were paying $12,000 a year in taxes. So you really, they didn't have an ag exemption. So you really need to get an ag exemption. And when you buy property, when you come out and buy property, that's the first thing you got to know is if, do they have an ag exemption? If they don't, it takes five years to get one. So you need to get one and you need to be sure that you keep it because it will save you a ton of money. I would probably be paying eight or $9,000 a year in taxes if it wasn't for my ag exemption. So it's very important. Uh, you can't get a wildlife. No, that, no, you cannot get a wildlife unless, unless you, you have, have the ag exemption, exemption first to That's begin right. with. That's right. So it's very important that that be part of your plan when you're gonna, if you're gonna buy some property and move out, that you check into the uh, ag exemption if they've got one and what that county requires for you to have one and how long it takes. Because it's very important, uh, unless money doesn't matter. If you've got lots of money, it doesn't matter. But uh, to us, we don't have a lot of money. And the other thing we didn't mention is location of our place. You know, in Milan County, there's a lot of property for sale and, and it's out miles from town and in order to get there you have to go down county roads which are dirt roads we bought one of the best part of selling parts to us on this property is that it's proximity to town we're a one mile from the city limits and our dirt road to get to our property is probably 100 yards long now if you've got to go down a, a dirt road three or four miles most of the time that dirt road is going to tear up your car or your truck in a very short order because it's they just don't keep them very well and it's the type of road the road material they use and whoever is the county commissioner how often he grades it and the weather you can't grade it when it's real dry you, you've got to have some rain in order to grade the roads so that's another consideration of why this property was more valuable to me is its proximity to town if we if if you live 10 miles out and you need a gallon of milk that's a 20 mile drive to the grocery store or you've got to do really good planning in in our case it's a couple of miles to the grocery store and i own a business in town so it's about two miles to my business two or three miles so i can get to work in five ten minutes and then i'm right there by the store coming home but if you live out in the country uh, and i'm talking about way out 10 or 15 miles from town uh, it's a consideration as to what you're going to pay for the property and what you're willing to do. You got to be, it, it, it will tear up your vehicle and it's hard, hard to manage. Living in the country too is it, we, when we go to Austin or a big city and we deal with all the traffic and everything. And when we go to town, we get frustrated because we have to stay at the one stoplight for a couple of minutes. For a couple of minutes before we turn, you know. You got five <laughs> minutes from your place into where you're going 
and sometimes it gets frustrating. That's why we come to town every once in a while, just to remember how lucky we yeah. are. And one thing I, I, I want to say about living in the country versus living in the city, living in the country is more personal. And what I mean by that is that we know all of our neighbors. We know everybody that lives up and down our road, uh, all the neighbors that river, live around us, and if we need help or they need help, it's very easy to get it. Just oh, pick up the phone, call them. Good neighbors. We, we get together uh, at least once a year and have something on the back porch for them. Then I know uh, living in a small town, I go into the grocery store. We have a Walmart and a Brookshire Brothers. I go in there. I never go in there that I don't see a whole bunch of people I know and get to visit with. Whereas in the city, it's, it's kind of impersonal. You, you don't know everybody that lives up down your street. We lived in Dallas for a while, lived in San Antonio, and we knew a couple of the neighbors and the people we worked with, and that was it. Here, we know people all over town. If somebody, if I need something, uh, like I needed something from my feed man one day, and it was on a Sunday, I called him. He came down to the feed store. He opened up the feed store and got it for me because we were leaving real early the next morning and I wanted to have it before we left and before he opened. And I called him and he came down and opened his feed store after church and, and got me what I needed. Well, and the same thing you do. Any, yeah. Anytime anybody needs something from the welding supply. Yeah. You ready to go? No. Yeah, I've sure. been down to the store and got it for him. So it's, it's more personal. It's more, I'm not going to say friendly, because people are in the general sense are friendly everywhere, but you know more people in a small community. Now, I've got a brother, he, he wouldn't live in, a, in a, a town like we do. He's told me he lives over in Austin. He didn't want to know his neighbor. He doesn't want them knowing what he's doing. I said, well, you know, if you've got, if you got a clear conscience, it doesn't matter. But <clears throat> it is nice to have, when we go on a trip, We've got cats, barn cats, and and we have leave some horses behind. We've got neighbors that'll come feed them, uh, but vice versa, we'll do all that for them too if they need it. So, it's living in the country has a lot of pluses, but there are some negatives, and you've got to be be careful about where you buy property and where you, how much you pay. Now, I sit on the Milam County Appraisal Review Board which is a function of the appraisal district, but we don't work for the appraisal district. We're appointed in an independent body. And if you have a grievance or you think your property is a value too high, or you come, if you can't work it out with the appraisal district, you come to the review board. And we sit through this stuff all the time. And uh, the values in the county are driven by market. And that's what people pay. And Milam County has got a, pl a close proximity to Austin, and uh, we have people moving in from Austin, we have people moving in from Dallas and Houston and buying property. And the property looks cheap to them, but it's really driving the prices up. And you've, you've got these people come in and say, well, I paid $200 an acre for this property. How could it be worth this much? Well, it's worth this much because this guy came in from Dallas and he bought a similar property to yours and he paid $3,000 an acre for it. Well, the appraisal district has to figure that in. It has to be at market value. So your property is worth $3,000 an acre. So you have to pay taxes based on the valuation it was that, that year. It's valued every January the 1st. And a lot of people can't understand that, but that's the way it is. So when you're, if you're from the city and you're moving to the country, just try to be conscious of what you're paying for. It may look cheap to you because you're paying $5,000 an acre or $10,000 an acre, but you really need to, to know the area and know what the value of the property is around there. Or have a good agent. Okay. Have a really good agent. <laughs> have a really, really good, good agent. agent. I recommend a good agent. Yeah. Yeah. One of the important things that you need to know that we've experienced over our 30 plus years of owning property around Texas is that by far it's the best investment we've ever made. We thought when we bought this place that we own now, we thought we were playing, paying way too much for it. But in the last 12 to 14 years, it's more than tripled in value. Uh, and we've been able to use it and enjoy it. Uh, so it is a really, really good investment. 
well, and sitting out on our front porch where we have our coffee. We were sitting and having our coffee one morning talking about decisions that we've made over the 51 years that have been good. The first one was getting married against all odds. We had, didn't have any money, no jobs. We were still in school and we did it anyway and it was, it was a really good decision. Um, then we, another good decision was, uh, we had several good decisions, buying the store that are getting ready to retire. We bought the uh, welding supply store. That was a good one. But another one of the best ones we ever made was buying this piece of property. It was, it, it even though we had no money at the time, we had, um, <laughs> well, most of the time we didn't have a window, a, Pot to piss, piss in, in our window, window to throw, throw it out, out of, and it, but it it became a good investment and a, a, and a and great decision. A great decision. So I have been sitting here patiently waiting for for when in the pecking order was the great decision to have a second child. I just oh, that was did, such did a that. Did that, yeah. that, did that, was, even, that we had no. Did idea that even make coming. the top ten? I, apparently, it wasn't even in the realm of. Well, of possible you know, decisions. We had two categories. The worst mistakes we ever made and the oh, greatest, okay. All right. greatest things we've ever done. It was somewhere in the somewhere in between. We ever and made. actually it was it wasn't a decision. No. It was just a it just happened. You just happened. <laughs> God God told us that that's what he wanted us to have a second child, so that's what we did. That's what we, All did. Right. we didn't have a choice. Thank you guys. I just want to say how much I really appreciate y'all uh, coming and sharing your stories. I know that this is going to add value to people's lives and thank you for uh, participating. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anytime. Hey everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as, uh, as much as I did. Just remember anytime you're ready to move forward, just give us a call, send us an email, send us that Pony Express note, any which way. We've got your back and we look forward to getting to know you and helping you find that great piece of heaven here on earth.